Welcome to all of you. For those of you who don't know who this person is standing in front of you, my name is Anil Arana, and um, I'm one of the people who kind of make this thing happen. Now, God is going to do something really amazing here tonight. You want to say amen if you believe that? Amen. Say amen even if you don't believe that. Amen. All right, okay. There is a little joke, uh, not a very funny joke, uh, that is told of a gunman who once walked into a very crowded church, went right up front, brandished his submachine gun at everybody and said, anyone who's not a real Christian, get out. About 95% of the church vanished, zoop, like that. He looked at the few people who remained, smiled at them, put his gun down and said, now that we know who the real Christians are, let us worship the Lord. In a way, in a way, in a way, there is a gunman in the church today. His name is Jesus. And as you listen to him today, I want you to ask yourself, am I a real Christian? Because I think that over the last 1,700 years, we have diluted and corrupted the gospel so much, it has lost its true substance, it has lost its true meaning. And I think there are a lot of Christians walking around in the world who have no idea who Christ is or what he said. There is a gunman in the church today. Do you want to listen to him? Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to read to you from John chapter 6, where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. On hearing it, many of the disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? The spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. This, my brothers and sisters, is the gospel of the Lord. If Jesus was here tonight, and I want you to imagine that he is, in fact, I want you to believe that every word spoken to you tonight comes straight from his lips. If it helps you imagine it is not me, 
for him and he would say these words to you that he said 2000 years ago to a bunch of people who were following him what would you do eat my flesh drink my blood you think he's a lunatic and there is a possibility that many of you who are listening to him would leave how can i understand this teaching how can i do what this man is asking me to do this is insanity and there's the i a lot of you would have left 12 years ago I came to a knowledge of Christ. I had a very powerful conversion experience and I moved from being a total atheist to a hardcore believer. My wife wasn't very happy. She said you went from one extreme to another. All I wanted was a normal husband. Now that was funny actually I thought. I understood what my wife was saying. we like normality we like to have a balance between things we do not like to walk on one extreme or the other we like things to be sugar coated i have been an extremist for a long time my preachings were very hard i shouted a lot at people in order to shake them up to rattle them But I realized over the last couple of years my teachings had become tamer. I felt sorry for people. I felt sorry when I had to shout at them and tell them to do things that they couldn't do. And I realized that as I made allowances for them, I was making allowances for myself too. And where my life has always been black and white, it started to move into shades of gray. This year Jesus rocked me to the core of my being. He said, "How dare you? How dare you? How dare you dilute the words that I said? How dare you put your own spin on things that I said?" He said, "From now on, I want you to say things just the way that I said it. And if people walk out on you, then so be it, because they walked out on me as well." So I decided I was going to preach the gospel the way Jesus said it. And I realized that it is not an easy gospel to listen to. Let me give you an example. When the Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and on the way a man said to him, "Master, I will follow you." Jesus said, "Foxes have holes and birds in the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay." his head imagine that you are this man who says to jesus i will follow you wow you might not have a place to lay your head you may not have a place to sleep you really want to follow me what do you think this man did out the door out the door Jesus said to another man, "You follow me." And this man said to Jesus, "Lord, let me bury my father. He just lost his father the previous day." And Jesus said to him, "Let the dead bury their own dead. There's nothing more you can do for your father. You come and follow me." What do you think this man did? What do you think you would do if you lost your parent the day before? And you said to Jesus, "Jesus, I need to go and bury him." And he said, "Leave your father alone. Come and follow me." What would you do? At the door. What a heartless man this is. He doesn't care about my father. Why should I follow him? Are you getting what I'm saying? Another man said, "Okay, I will follow you." Now he's getting a little nervous like I know some of you are. And he says, "I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. I got a father and mother, they're ailing, they're aged. I have a spouse, she loves me, she cares for me." I got two children. I need to look after them. And Jesus said to them, "If you want to follow me, follow me now. Leave them alone." What would you do if you were here out the door? But you're still sitting. You're still listening. 
You're listening to the words of a man who never ever diluted anything that he had to say. He said it just like it had to be said. And the people left, they left. We become obsessed with numbers in the church today. A preacher walks into town and he attracts crowds and he promises healing and we forget about everything else and run after him. Someone else walks into town and he's known as a dynamic speaker and we run after him. Someone else comes and says, you come and listen to Jesus and you will get prosperity and you will be blessed in everything that you want and we run after him. How about running after Jesus for a change? How about listening to the things that he has to say for a change, even though they might be hard? I sometimes think that Jesus had the craziest recruitment policy I've ever seen anyway. He didn't put posters up. He didn't put huge banners up. He didn't say healing service tonight, come for it. He just spoke. Of course he healed people. And people went to him for the healing. And because he had tremendous compassion in his heart, he healed just about everybody who came to him, set, set them free. But then he spoke to them words, words that must have pierced their very hearts, their very beings, their very souls, and frightened the daylights out of them. Shall I give you one more example? If anyone does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You want to be a disciple of Christ? This is what he said. In the same manner, if anyone does not leave everything and follows me, he cannot be my disciple. Leave everything and follow him. A rich young man went to Jesus one day. He did everything, everything the law asked him to do. But he wanted to be affirmed. He wanted to be vindicated. He wanted maybe to have a pat on his back. So he went to Jesus and said, what is the secret of eternal life? And Jesus said, you know the commandments, honor your father and your mother. Do not steal, do not cheat, do not covet your neighbor's wife or his cow or whatever else. And the young man said very self-righteously, all this I do. What else do I need to do? And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. What do you think the young man did? He left. Just like hundreds of other people left Jesus. The moment they heard him say what he expected them to do. You know the story of Lazarus and the rich man? There was this rich man who lived in this huge mansion. He wore the finest of clothes. He ate the best of food. And there's nothing wrong with that except outside his mansion there was a beggar who sat there day after day with nothing to eat. Sores covered his body and the dogs would come and lick his sores. The rich man would drive past this beggar twice a day, three times a day, four times a day, but he no, never so much as looked at this man. Never so much as gave him anything to eat or anything to drink. One day the beggar died and he went to heaven. The rich man also died and he was carried away to hell. And there from hell he saw Lazarus living a life that he could only dream of while he himself was in agony. And he said to whoever was in charge, please let Lazarus come here and give me a drop of water. And the reply he got was this. The divide that separates the two of you is too wide for anyone to cross. You cannot go there and he cannot come here. While you lived on earth, you never gave this person anything to drink. Don't expect him to give you anything to drink now. I never say anything to you that Jesus has not said to me first and 
When I shared this story with people, you know what he asked me? He said, Anil, do you think you might be like the rich man? And I said, what? And he said, think about it for a minute. And because I cannot ignore anything that he says to me, I thought about it and I started to weep because I realized in many ways I was like that rich man. And I had Joseph with me. This happened in Lebanon and he saw me weeping and he said, why are you crying? Look at how much you do. He tried to console me the best he could and I let myself be consoled but that night I couldn't sleep because over and over again I kept thinking about the life that I led and the life that others led as well. There are one billion people on this planet who are dying of starvation. There are two billion people on this planet who don't have a roof over their heads. Whereas I sleep in a comfortable bed. It might be a different bed every night, but it is a comfortable bed. I eat good food and I always have water to drink. And I couldn't help but think, yes, Jesus, you're right. We mourn, don't we? When things aren't going well in our lives, when we have to struggle a little bit, we mourn and we whine, don't we? Think for one minute that in the time since I started speaking to you, 50,000 children have died of a disease that could have been prevented or of starvation. 50,000 children have died in the last 20 minutes alone. Your children, is any of them going to sleep hungry tonight? Is any of them going thirsty tonight? If they were, you would move heaven and earth to make sure that they had something in their stomach before this night was over. They looked after who cares about the rest of the world. No. Who cares about a little baby in Somalia who has his stomach bloated but his body is like sticks. His flies buzzing over him for the souls around him. He doesn't have a mother or a father. All he would like is maybe one drop of water to drink and there isn't any around. Who cares about him? As long as our children have something to eat. There's a gunman in the church today. One day we're going to die. One day we're going to heaven. One day Jesus is going to stand at the door and he's going to ask you, when I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. When I was naked, you gave me nothing to wear. When I was sick, you didn't tend to me. God help us if we say to him, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you naked? When did we see you sick? Because he will say to us, whatever you did not do to the least of your brothers, you did not do unto me. What a shame. What a shame. What a shame. What a shame. I'm not saying any of this to make you feel guilty. <clears throat> I know you're good people. I know you're good people. I'm not saying any of this to make you feel guilty. I'm saying all of this to shake you out of your complacency. To shake you out of this belief that everything is all right with the world and everything is all right with you. It isn't. It isn't. 
One day you are going to reach heaven. And one day you are going to have to answer for your actions. Jesus said again, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not heal the sick in your name and work miracles in your name and prophecy in your name? And he will say, away from me, you evildoer. I do not know you. I do not want any of us to have to go through that. To have to stand in front of the king of kings and be told, I don't know you. Just because you came and you worshipped me. Just because you came and you said, hallelujah. You think you know me? You don't know me. You haven't heard my word. And if you have heard my word, it has been diluted and corrupted to the point of being useless. My word is life. It is harsh, yes. It is hard, yes. It seems cruel, yes. My words are words of life. You will not understand them. You will not understand them as long as you remain in the world. You will understand them only if you move out of the world into my world, which is heaven. This was the theme of most of what I spoke about last year. How we need to be renewed by the transforming of our minds. And I realized we will not understand anything that Jesus says unless we understand this basic fact. There are two planes. One is the world and one is the kingdom of heaven. And the entire church, please listen to me. The entire church, Catholic, Protestant, everybody, they're walking in the ways of the world. One day Jesus had a little child come and stand in front of his audience. And he said to his audience, pointing to the child, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like one of these, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you know who he was talking to? Do you know who he was talking to? He was speaking to his apostles, people who knew him. People who loved him, people who left everything to follow him. He is saying to them, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like one of these, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Why was he saying it to them? Because they were arguing among themselves about who was the greatest. Imagine this for a minute. He's called them out of ordinary lives, simple, humble people. He believed that they would be the ones who would be able to take his message of humility to the world. But what are they doing? Just a few months with Jesus and they start to argue with themselves. Who is the greatest? In fact, there was a time when Jesus told them he was going to die. Two of them went to him and said, when you die, Jesus, let one of us sit on your left and one of us on your right. And then the other apostles got angry with these two. Why? Because they wanted to sit on his left and his right. Jesus is saying to them, forget about sitting to my left or my right. You're not even entering heaven unless you change. When is the last time somebody preached this to you? You're Christian, you're saved. Is this what Jesus says? You're saved if you get out of the world that you live in, into the kingdom of heaven. And the entire church this is an indictment. This is an indictment of the church and everyone who calls himself a Christian. How can you say that you're a follower of Christ when you're still doing the things that the world is doing? When you're still following their rules? Abortion is legal in most countries. It's murder. Homosexuality. They have gay marriages these days. If we speak about it in some countries, they can put you in jail. I'm warned what to speak about and what not to speak about when I go to the United States, when I go to Australia, when I go to certain places in Europe. I'm told, be careful. 
I'm supposed to be afraid? I'm supposed to be afraid of the world? Jesus also has something to say here. He said, do not be afraid of those who might kill your body, but be afraid of the one who can destroy your soul. We put our souls on the line. We put our souls on the line. 2,000 years. 2,000 years this entire planet should have been Christian. Where's Christianity? Are there real Christians in the house today? Because I'm looking for them. And so is God. Because if we want to change the world again, we need people who listen to the word of God, who believe the word of God, and are prepared to obey the word of God unconditionally without making excuses, without making justifications. Yes, the word of God is harsh, but that's only because we're listening with the ears of the world. Get into the other side and see how everything starts to make sense and see how we don't need to fear anything at all. During my last mission to Lebanon, I'd gone there before I went to Australia, New Zealand. I'm just come back from there. And we went to minister to a group of drug addicts. They were in this rehab center, and I want to talk to them. And God really does amazing things wherever we go. And he brought a lot of healing to their hearts, and every one of them felt tremendous love sweep over them. So I told them that when they left the rehab center, I said they're not going to come back because God has replaced their addictions with his love, with his great love. And I told them what they needed to do was to share this love around the world, to go to people who needed it. I look at the terrorists in the world today. I look at all those who do hateful, hurtful things to each other. And I realize the only problem with them is that they have no love in their hearts. And why don't they have love in their hearts? Because no one has given them this love. So I told them, now you've discovered this love. Take it to the people who don't have it. Take it to the people in Syria, Daesh, you know them as ISIS. Take it to Nigeria, to Boko Haram. Take it to those people who sow destruction in the world. There was an old man sitting at the back of the church. He was the gatekeeper. As we were leaving, he stopped the car like that. He made us roll on the windows. He put his head in and he said, you know, Muslim leaders send their children out telling them to kill Christians while they themselves stay at home doing nothing. Today I heard you tell our children to go and face Daesh while you yourself sit at home doing nothing. I didn't say anything. I went home. And I said, Jesus, did you say these things to me? And he said, yes. I know you travel a lot. I know you speak very boldly. I know you talk to just about everyone you get the opportunity to talk to. But I don't see you talking to people who might cut your head off. And I said, what is it that you want me to do? You want me to go to Syria? And he said, yes. And I thought about it for a long minute. And then I said, okay, Lord. Because 11 years ago, I promised him that I would do anything he asked me to do, even die for him. So after I finished my current crop of missions, which include a trip to Brazil and Chennai, I go to Syria and possibly Iraq. And if someone were to cut my head off, so be it. Someone asked me after that, are you not afraid of dying? And I thought about it for a long minute. And I said, no. Because in Christ, I am already dead. And I need you to understand that. Because that is the basic truth about the faith that you profess to believe in. Because when you're baptized in Christ, read Romans chapter 5, you're baptized into Christ's death. Which means that when Christ died, you died with him, died to the world. Please listen. Because everything is key to, this is key to everything. 
When you die to the world, you get new life here on the other side in heaven. And heaven is not something that begins when you're buried six feet under the ground. Heaven begins the moment you accept Jesus as your savior. You're dead to the world. Please, get out. Get out of the world and get into where you should be. And that is the kingdom of God. In the late 1940s, during World War II, America commissioned the building of a battleship. It put in about $80 million to build this ship. $80 million in those days was a phenomenal amount of money. And by the end, they had the fastest ship that ever sailed the waters. It was a magnificent war machine that never needed to stop for fuels or supplies. It could circumvent the entire globe. It could take 15,000 soldiers, and I can just imagine what these soldiers must have looked like. Hard faces, hard eyes, men with purpose, men of determination, men who realize they have the power to defend the world and to change it forever. But this warship was never put to use because by the time it was constructed, the war was over. So this battleship was converted to a cruise liner. And where 15,000 men could once sail for war, it could now accommodate only 2,000 people because the rest of the ship was given to the greatest comforts available to man. 2,000 people did sail it whenever they could. The rich, rich men, businessmen, movie stars, singers, and I just can't help but think that the entire church has become a cruise liner. And if you just look at your lives, and if you look at the church once again, this is an indictment. We're all in the battleship. We're all settled comfortably in our lives. We're all going. Where are we going? I don't know. To heaven? I hope so. Unmindful of the world around us and unmindful of all the people around us who need God. I spoke about one billion people dying of starvation. I spoke about one billion, two billion people without a home over their heads. There are 4.5 billion people who don't know Jesus and are headed straight to hell on a one-way ticket. What do we care? What does the church care? We got our people. Come and see. Come and see the way I heal you. Come and see the quality of my worship. Come and see how powerful my preaching is. Come and see how beautiful my church looks. Doesn't matter that the whole world is going to hell. Come and see. Not here. Not here. Here you come and see, you're most welcome. But after you come and see, you go. You go because Jesus said, I send you out like lambs among wolves. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. He said, go and change this world. Go and tell people that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Come and see, yes. But then go and tell. If you're not interested in going and telling, I'm not interested in you. If you're not interested in saving the world and only care about your hides, I'm not interested in you. If you care only about your comforts and don't care about the poor in the world, I don't care about you. There's a gunman in the church today. Only he doesn't carry a gun. He carries the word of God. And that is more powerful than any gun ever invented. And I'm telling you, this has penetrated your hearts so deep, even if you wanted to be the same, you couldn't. 
because you're not going to be un yeah, able to unhear anything that I said today. And every single thing that I said to you today are words that Jesus himself said. Every single thing that I said. You don't like what I said, you don't like what he said, and if you don't like me, you don't like him. Are there any real Christians in this church today? I don't care about crowds. Jesus didn't. Think about it. Just think about it for a minute. He preached all this hard stuff and people left. His own disciples left because they couldn't swallow the things he had to say. They said, this is too hard. It is hard. But it is the truth. And if you believe Jesus, then the truth shall set you free. And the truth has set me free in a way that you will not believe. I'm not ridding myself of everything that I have. But now I care more about those who don't have what I have. And if there is anything that I can do to minimize my expenditure, to reduce my necessities to the bare minimum, then I will do that. Because I won't have it on my conscience that I live a comfortable life when some people don't have a life to live. I remember I told you about a motorcycle last year and I was so happy that I bought it. The reason I bought it is because I didn't have a car for the longest time and I needed something to move around with and I thought a motorcycle would be a good thing. But instead of buying just any motorcycle, I got myself a Harley. It wasn't expensive. It was cheaper than a Yaris. But Jesus asked me last week if I really needed a Harley. And I said, Lord, it's just a bike. And people respect me on the road. And they're less likely to run me over if I'm in a good machine. And he just quietly said to me, Anil, I thought you were capable of more honesty than that. And I stopped arguing. I said, I'll sell it, Lord and use the money for the poor. I don't expect to die in Syria. If I do, I'm not frightened because I have God's word that says he will work for the good of all those who love him. And I'm constantly reminded of Stephen's death Stephen was a very anointed man of God. Miracles used to follow him wherever he went, and people got jealous. So one day they trumped up charges against Stephen, hauled him in front of the Sanhedrin, who ordered him stoned. As he went to his death, Scripture says that Stephen's face looked like an angel. And he looked up to heaven, and he saw Jesus standing up for him. And he said to Jesus before he died, the same words that Jesus said before he died, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Now the last line in this chapter says something that a lot of people miss. It says, and Saul was there, giving approval to his death. And I can't help but imagine what must have gone through in Saul's mind as he saw Stephen dying. Saul was a man who knew scripture. He studied under Gamaliel, who was one of the leaders of his time. And because he knew scripture, Saul thought he knew God. But when he saw Stephen and the way that he died, something must have gone in his head. I only know about God, but there is a man who really knows God. And even though it took a few days for Saul to come to the realization of who this God was, I believe that Saul changed at that moment when he saw Stephen die in front of his eyes. Die without fear, die with dignity. And if I die in Syria or anywhere else, 
I believe that there will be somebody watching and God will change that person and maybe that person will become another Paul in today's world and where I might have been able to reach 10 million people, this man might be able to reach 100 million people and that would have made it worth it. But more than that, maybe I hope that you people sitting over here will realize that if a man loves God so much, he's willing to go to his death, then at least you can get out of those chairs that you sit in and go and start doing something about this world that we live in. Unless a grain of seed falls to the ground and dies, it doesn't bear fruit. And for a long time, I've always said, I'm willing to die for my friends. I walk the talk. I practice what I preach. Because I know Christ. Because I no longer belong to the world. I belong to heaven. And over here I will live forever. There's a gunman in the church today. Nobody has left, which means that you just might be real Christians. And if you are, listen to the words of Jesus. Believe in the things that he has said and obey what he asks you to do without question and we will change this world you and me together Father God we want to thank you for this evening we want to thank you for the words that you have spoken to your people I know it has shaken them but I believe you intended to shake them, Lord, out of their slumber, out of their lethargy, out of their sense of complacency, and get them moving into this while doing things. We've been challenged here tonight. We've been challenged more than we possibly ever have been challenged, even though over the past years, every time there's a speaker who's taken the mic and has spoken your words, it has served to penetrate their hearts. But here, Lord, today everyone has understood that in the end there is an option that we all exercise. That we can listen and listen and listen and pretend we're going somewhere. Or we can listen and say, I want to do something. I just don't want to hear that there are a billion people starving. I want to do something to feed them. And even if I feed one person, it would be one person saved from starvation, Lord. And that is what? Something. We hear about millions of babies being aborted every year. And we can just clock in sympathy and feel that the sympathy we feel is enough. Or we can try to do something to stop the slaughter and go and speak to someone who wants to kill her baby and say, don't do that and save one life, and that has to mean something. We can speak about the homeless. We can speak about those in trouble, those in difficulty. And we can say to them, yes, we're gonna pray for you because we're concerned about you. Or we can say, let me try to help. And even if there's one person in this world that we bring relief to, there's one person in this world that we can put a roof over if there's one person in this world that we can comfort that is one person more than nothing. And Lord, all of these four billion people who don't know Christ and who are headed to hell, even if there's one person we can bring to salvation, that is one person brought home, and that is worth something. And so this talk today, Lord, I 
Just pray. I pray with all my heart. Not only challenges, but inspires my brothers and sisters to get out of their cruise ship and get into the battleship because the church was created for that. To go out into a hostile world. To go out into people who might kill us and slaughter us and even eat us. And to say to them, Jesus Christ is alive and he's my Lord. And I think you need to know about him. And if we lose our life in the process, Lord, what should it matter if we all believe that in you we're already dead? Lord, it's only you and your spirit who can do anything. It is only your spirit that can breathe life into dead bones, that it could put flesh back onto our bodies, that can give us a determination, that can give us courage and strength. So we ask you for your spirit to come down and Lord, if my words are not to go to waste, then let your spirit come down in power as we sing. Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Move among us with holy fire as we lay aside all earthly desire. inspire us to read the Word of God again, especially the Gospels, to listen to every word that Jesus says without sugarcoating it, to listen to Him just as He said it. Because Lord, if we listen to what Jesus says the way He said it, we know that we will be changed forever and in turn we will change the world forever. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into everything that we do. We ask that you take over, take control of our lives and 
everything we say and everything we think and everything we do. We truly, Lord, love you. We love our Father in heaven and we love Jesus to whom we are grateful for many reasons, but especially that he died for us so that we might live and live lives of abundance. But we're not, we're not. Even as we try to guard our lives, we're losing it, Lord, every day. But help us to once again understand what Jesus said, that if we lose our lives, we will secure it for all eternity. Help us to get new understanding, new insights, Lord, every day. And Lord, Lord, be with us always. We know that once again we have Jesus' word that he will be. And as we leave here tonight, let us take that reassurance with us that even as he sends us out, even as he says, go, he says, remember, I will be with you forever until the end of the age. So thank you, Lord. And praise you, Lord, and glorify you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Please be seated just a couple of minutes. Thank you. Nobody is still left. <laughs> I find the need to tell you why I did what I did today. We think that there is time. There isn't. And we need to live every day of our lives as though it is the last day we have. Because you never know, it might be. And if you start living life like that, you will live life far better than you're leaving it today. And you will understand that whatever you do here on earth is just going to vanish. But whatever you do for the kingdom of heaven will stay forever. And that will change the way you think about things and the way you do things. Everything, I promise you. Live tomorrow like that. Ever since I decided I was going to Syria, I make every minute count. I don't expect to die. I really don't. But what if I just have two months left? Would I want to waste a minute? What if you lived life like that? That you didn't have two months, but you just had the day. You will start be, becoming kinder to those around you. You start being more loving. You start being more caring. When you see somebody on the road who doesn't have something to eat, you will reach out and give them something to eat. When you see somebody in pain, you will want to do something to bring healing to that person who is suffering. You will want to do this. It's a good way of living, as though every day is your last. And truly, truly, you will see how insignificant a lot of the things we worry about start to get how much you worry about things around you, how much you worry about your jobs, your relationships. It all starts to get into perspective when you just understand this little fact. So whatever I said to you today, I know it's dumb, but I promise you they're words of life. And when you start to move from the world into heaven, they become words of abundant life. And that is the abundant life I want all of you to lead. You know how free I am today? You won't even begin to imagine. I am the freest man on this planet today. I want you to be like that. And having experienced it, I want you to make sure that everyone in the world is like that too.